There you go. Summer arrives on Monday. Sir Ian Diamond is the UK's national statistician and the head of the Office of National Statistics. The government are waiting for his latest figures before they finalise details of the first phase of the unlocking to be announced next week. He's running a massive study with up to 300,000 people to see just how far the virus has really spread in the UK. And I spoke to him just before we came on air. I asked him to begin with what he thinks the true number of people who have died because of COVID-19 in the UK is right now. Well, I think uh, the numbers uh, on the podium yesterday were 28,131. And I think that's a good starting point because I think the Public Health England has done a very good job recently to bring in care home deaths. But let's remember, those are only uh, the deaths where there's been a positive um, test uh, that has shown COVID-19. I think we need to add to that um, a number that we will find as we get death registrations where the medical practitioner, without a test, uh, has placed COVID-19 uh, on the death certificate. And I suggest that that will push us towards uh, 30,000. But I think we also need to remember uh, that at the moment, we are seeing the highest number of deaths each week that we at the Office of National Statistics have recorded um, since uh, weekly records started in 1993. And I think just, just, just before I comment, I think it's worth saying that each one of these deaths represents a, a family grief, a, of friends being really upset. And we always remember that at the Office of National Statistics. But when we see these very, very high levels of deaths, not all of them, not all of them are, are the result uh, of COVID-19. The last week we had uh, records for uh, the excess was approaching uh, 12,000 deaths, of which uh, I would suggest between eight and 9,000 uh, were, were, were COVID, uh, and then the rest or what we call indirect deaths. Those could be, you know, for example, uh, people who would normally have gone into hospital uh, for, for, for some reason, um, and, but, the death, but the beds were not available. Just to give you an example. In my late mother's uh, last couple of years uh, of her life, she went into hospital and back out again a few times. Had she not been able to go in uh, one of those times, she may well have died a little earlier than she did. And, and so I think it's important to recognise um, that there are indirect deaths as well as the COVID-related deaths. We have a piece uh, from the Office of National Statistics that we've done jointly with the Government Actuaries Department, the Home Office and Department of Health coming out uh, in, in the next few days, which will show also a third group which will come out over the next few years uh, where changes in the prioritisation of the health service, for example, reductions in cancer screening, will lead to, 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 to deaths over the next few years. And the final thing I would just like to say, Andrew, is that if we have a lengthy and deep recession, uh, then we know that that can lead to increased uh, deaths as people are pushed um, by in, into lengthy periods of unemployment. Uh, so uh, the, the actually, if you like, the, the headline numbers um, uh, of where that I started with need to be um, adjusted and, and, and added to by those indirect deaths. And so looking again for a total, perhaps something like north of 30,000 is what, is what you seem to be implying. And can I add to that this excess deaths measurement? The Financial Times' Chris Giles has done an assessment and he says he thinks about 60% more than the hospital deaths that are being announced is the kind of figure we should be looking at. Well, Chris Giles is a very um, good uh, statistical journalist. Um, I'm not going to go to 60%, but because I think it, you know, one is, one is uh, projecting there and it's very, very difficult um, to, to do that. But absolutely, certainly, uh, the indirect deaths that come on top of the actual COVID-19 deaths are not insignificant. It sounds to me as if, for what you're saying, that we may be heading, indeed, for the worst death toll in Europe at the moment. I wouldn't say that at all. Um, and um, I would say... Uh, that making international comparisons, Andrew, is an unbelievably difficult thing to do. Uh, we, uh, in, in this country, have, in my opinion, and let me be clear, I would say this, wouldn't I, that I think we have the best reporting, the most transparent reporting, uh, and the most timely reporting, because we include death registrations, and we've been pushing our death registration um, reporting as fast as we possibly can. 
Um, and, and then even after you look at the actual deaths, it's incredibly important to recognize that the context. So um, deaths are going to be more concentrated, as I've already indicated, in inner cities. If you have a rural country, um, then it's likely that your death rates uh, will be lower. I'm not saying um, that um, we're, we're at the bottom of any potential league table. It's almost impossible to calculate a league table, uh, but uh, I'm not prepared to say that we're heading to the top. Um, and can I be clear, does this mean that we will never, ever know? Uh, well, we'll certainly be able to give you some very, very accurate data um, around, uh, obviously, COVID-19. We will be able to make some pretty accurate uh, estimates uh, in uh, the, the, the short to medium term around many uh, of those excess deaths. Uh, but as I said, the, the estimation of the deaths that uh, might come if there were, if there were, and let me be clear, so much is being done to avoid uh, a lengthy recession. But if there were to be a lengthy recession, it'd be very, very difficult to get an absolutely accurate count there. Can I ask you about this very important R number, which is the rate of reproduction of the disease, the rate of spreading of the disease? And if it's under one, that's a good thing. And if it's above one, that's a very bad thing. What is your current estimate of the R number? Well, I think it might, I'm very clear that it's under one um, from the estimates uh, that one can make. Uh, and we're doing everything we can to support the really excellent um, and high level modelling that is being done uh, by colleagues right across uh, the country uh, who are, are making some of those estimates. Now, the ONS is carrying out this big national survey. What do you think it's going to tell us? Well, we, we are through the initial peak. I'm really clear in my mind about that. What we now need to do over the next uh, year or so, or, or uh, until we have a vaccine uh, or, or a really good treatment, what we now need to do is we need to monitor the course uh, of the epidemic to understand uh, the, the, the proportion of people at any time who are carrying the virus and also the proportion uh, of people who, who have antibodies against the virus. And that's why we have uh, worked with colleagues uh, at um, the University of Oxford, Wellcome Trust, to be able to, to design a really good national survey which will enable us to understand uh, both those things. Does it give you any indication yet at all of how many people have had COVID-19 in Britain? It, it's too early, Andrew. I mean, I'd be delighted to come back in a few weeks' time and give you an authoritative answer to yeah, that. Yeah. Um, you know, these surveys like this typically take uh, months to put into place. We've managed to put this in the field in 10 days. Uh, and we are just starting uh, to get uh, some initial uh, results, um, um, but it's too early to be able to give you an estimate of R or indeed an estimate of prevalence. Now, you said the peak we've passed in the country. I, I don't know whether you've got any indication of when we passed the peak, but I wonder what, why you think care homes are still such a problem. Well, I think care homes you know, represent a, a real challenge. Uh, and, of course, some of the reasons for that is we know um, that here are a group of people, often with comorbidities, often very old. And so we have been working hard uh, with our colleagues uh, in Public Health England to, to design um, some studies properly to look at that. And I'm hoping that we'll be going into the field uh, in the next very short while with that. This week, the ONS um, published data on the larger proportion of poorer people who have, have uh, dying of COVID-19. And I wonder what your thoughts are. There are lots and lots of reasons why this might be happening, but what are your indications as to why? Is, is it to do with kind of density of population or obesity or comorbidities or what? Well, I'd certainly say it's likely to be with to do with uh, density of population. It is likely also to be with comorbidities, also people uh, in, in poorer areas are, are probably going to be in jobs which make them less likely to be able to work from home, so, so they may be uh, more uh, exposed. Um, and, and of course, you know, we always know that inner cities uh, are, are the most uh, risky places. So, but I have to say, having said that, um, the, the, these numbers are stark. Um, but we have known for a very, very long time um, that ill health uh, and mortality has a gradient towards the poorest and most disadvantaged members of our society. Uh, and it is sad that that is shown uh, clearly also uh, with regard to COVID-19.
I suppose there's an allied question about so-called BAME or ethnic minority deaths. Now, I know the ONS doesn't track ethnicity, and I wonder whether you're going to do that and what your thoughts are about the higher number of BAME people who are dying of this. I think it's um, you know, very clear that the uh, higher number of BAME people uh, are uh, dying, and we, in our next uh, study that will come out, uh, I hope, later this week, uh, are looking uh, at that issue. And I think it's important to recognise uh, that we, what we try to do is look at it at the same time as occupation, so that we are able um, to really understand um, the, the, the link between occupation uh, and COVID and also between BAME uh, and COVID. And we'll, we'll be doing uh, that uh, this week. Uh, I think it's something that we need to look at, or we are looking at, incredibly carefully. Um, finally, if I may, um, everybody is now starting to think about the timing and the how of the ending of the lockdown. And I wonder whether um, you've picked up anything about people's anxieties about going back to work, anxieties about the end of the lockdown that might have some influence on how ministers will eventually decide to do this. Well, our job is to inform uh, government with, with data. And one of the things we have done is that we have been doing a weekly survey uh, of people's attitudes to and indeed adherence uh, to the lockdown. Uh, and, and the results uh, show, yes, people very large numbers of people, uh, over 80%, uh, are reporting that they are concerned still, that they um, are, are worried about not being able to make plans, uh, and, and, and that they are worried um, about the future. On the other hand, um, we're seeing uh, a, a reduction in them being concerned about things like being able to get um, staples and, and being able to get food uh, and other uh, goods. Um, and we are finding those people who uh, are homeschooling are feeling able to do that. So we are informing uh, government both that the adherence to the lockdown, I think it has been very successful, has been very, very uh, good. Uh, and we're giving all the information we can about what uh, people uh, are feeling uh, about that lockdown. At the end of the day, ministers have a very difficult decision to make. They do. Thank you very much indeed for talking to us, Sir Ian. Much appreciated and absolutely fascinating. Thanks.